Did you guys miss us? It's been a long time. <laughs> um, so Randy talked about the structure and how you do storytelling. We want to do a little more to expand on why you want to do storytelling and why, in particular, you want to do the kind of storytelling that we do, which is this personal storytelling talking about your own lives. And we do a lot of work with storytellers. Um, we work with all kinds of people, like he said, carpenters, bartenders, but also a lot of scientists and doctors and other technical types. And we have discovered that when we work with these people, often we're confronted uh, with a question they ask us, or rather a statement, where they'll come to us and they'll say, look, I'm not interesting. People don't care about me. What they want to hear about is my research. Which is when we're forced to tell them that they could not possibly be more wrong. Uh, because actually, we are interested in you. We're interested in your thoughts and feelings and what motivates you. And we're less interested in what you put in your lab report. Because the statistics aren't enough. You have to have the personal connection to get people interested. It's the difference between hearing 100 people have died of cancer and hearing that your own mother has died of cancer. The first one might objectively be more important, but the second one is what's going to really affect you and spur you into action. It's that, that personal connection is the key. It's, it's, you have to get to people and make them care about what you're talking about. And the way they care is the way we talk to each other and care about anything in our lives is we listen to our friends and our family. They tell us stories, and we understand how that's reflected in our lives. And through that, we understand them. And the exact same thing works with talking about research, with talking about medicine. Because, of course, the 100 people is more important. But the way to get people to care is to talk about the one and to let the little story represent the whole. It gets to the emotions that the stats miss. And the thing about this is that it, it's incredibly powerful, not just for getting people to understand the science or the medicine that you're talking about, but one of the really crucial pieces that often gets overlooked is it lets you get to the motivations of the scientists themselves. Which is very helpful talking to the general public, of which I am one. Uh, <laughs> shocking, I know. You probably all have me pegged as an astrophysicist. Uh, but I am, in fact, a non-scientist. And uh, one of the things that is always hard for me dealing with science is animal sacrifice. And I think that's true of a lot of members of the general public. Even those of us who buy curly light bulbs and follow space shuttle missions and agree that having rainforests is a good thing, uh, the <laughs> sacrifice of animals is a real challenge for us when it comes to science. Uh, recently on our stage, we had biologist Dan Diane Kelly tell a personal story about her struggle to sacrifice animals as part of her work. And she talked about how it was so hard for her that at one point she resorted to picking up armadillos off the side of the road just so she wouldn't have to kill animals. And listening to her tell her story of how she eventually accepted that animal sacrifice was part of her job and learned how to do it as humanely as possible, it was a huge breakthrough for me that made it palatable to me for the first time. Because it's really comforting to learn that scientists care about the same things you do. They have those same concerns. The stories can also lead you to new insights in your own work. And telling stories about your own life can help you understand your motivations and lead to new innovations yourself. Um, one great example we had of this uh, was we had a neuroscientist come in and he wanted to tell a story about how he developed a new uh, portable EEG device. And what had happened was he, he developed this thing for his mouse models and, and or rat models um, and he had this nifty little portable EEG thing that he could use and he, he thought there must be some application for humans but he had no idea what it was. And Right then, a, sort of a, a, a terrible accident uh, happened to one of his friends. She fell, hit her head, and in, when she was in the ER, she called him and said, um, should I do anything? And he said, well, you should get an EEG. You might uh, develop epilepsy because of this. And uh, there was no way to get it. And it turned out that in, in most hospital ERs, it's essentially impossible to get an EEG. And uh, due to several events later on, she ended up she did develop epilepsy because of this. And so immediately he knew what he needed to do. He needed to take this device, turn it into something that could be used in hospital ERs. Now here's the bit that drives Aaron and me absolutely bonkers. We were bonkers. rehearsing with him, bonkers. Bonkers. Um, we were rehearsing with him and the, the story came in long. And so we started talking to him about what we could cut out of the story to get it down to time. And what he said was, well, let's just cut the bit about my friend. That's not the important part. 
And we're trained to do this. As, as scientists, you're trained that it's the objective thing at the end that's what matters. And of course, for the science, it is. But when you're talking about it, when you're dissecting what happened, when you're trying to convince people that it's important, or even when you're trying to understand for yourself how the process worked, you need to tell the story. Uh, so we are now going to put our money where our mouth is here. <laughs> And we are going to stop talking about theory, and Ben is going to share one of his personal stories. Yeah, you got to hear Aaron before. <laughs> so um, a few years ago, many years ago now, uh, I was sitting in the orange room at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and I was listening to a seminar on applications of non-perturbative quantum chromodynamics, <laughs> as you do. And, uh, the thing is, as fascinating as that uh, lecture was, I wasn't actually paying attention to it. Uh, instead, I was staring one by one at all of the other people in the room, and I was staring at them because I was terrified of them. Now, they weren't particularly terrifying people. They were perfectly ordinary, nerdy physicists. Um, they would go and gather around the coffee machine and talk about their lives and their kids, or more often their lack of kids. And, uh, and they would go out and they would have dinners and drink fancy wine and talk about esoteric theories of how the universe worked. And this was the problem, because at the time I was in my second year of grad school and I was also supposed to be going out to dinners and drinking fancy wine and talking about esoteric theories of how the universe worked, but I didn't have the foggiest idea what the phrase applications of non-perturbative quantum dynamics meant, nor could I say it. And, uh, and I, so I was staring at them convinced that at any moment, one of them was going to turn around and look at me and say, oh my god, everyone, we screwed up. Ben has no idea what's going on. And then they would all smack themselves on the head and say, oh my god, you're right. And then they would point and they would laugh and they would kick me out of the program and I would have wasted two years of my life and it would be a horrible humiliation and it would be a disaster. And it's right at that moment that I realized my heart rate was elevated, my breathing was shallow, and my left arm had gone numb. And I was having a heart attack. Now, at the time I was 23, and uh, doctors, you all, you don't really tell people what to do when you have a heart attack until they get to be about 40 or so. So I didn't really know. Um, I figured I should tell someone, but I wasn't going to tell anyone in that room. <laughs> so I slipped out, and I, I started uh, walking around trying to, to find someone, and uh, luckily the, uh, the lab had a lot of cell phones. It also had... Um, <laughs> It also had a doctor's office on site, uh, which was fantastic. And so I, I went in and I, I went up. The doctor was this wonderful old woman, I think about in her 60s. I think she'd been there since the lab was founded. And I, I came in and I said, in the, it was founded in the 70s, not that long ago. And, um, and I, I walked in and I said, I'm, I'm having a heart attack. And she stopped and she looked at me and she gave me this calm, clear look that very clearly said, oh no. Not this again. <laughs> Which isn't the look you expect to give when you tell a doctor that you've had a heart attack at 23. She sat me down and she said, look, you're not having a heart attack. You're having a panic attack. I see this all the time. You physicists drive yourselves nuts and then you go crazy and then you end up in here. So she did some tests and showed me some squiggles, which I didn't understand, but, but managed to convince me that I was fine. And she sort of starts showing me out the door. And as she's showing me out, she says, here's what you should do. Get some exercise. Best treatment for anxiety, get some exercise. So I went to a psychiatrist to see if I could get some medication. <laughs> and when I was there, um, I started talking to her about this. And I described what had happened and all the things I was going through. And she said, yeah, I see physicists in here all the time. I'm like, really? And she said, yeah, and also the chemists and the biologists and the mathematicians and the pre-meds and the English people and everyone, really. And, um, <laughs> and, and she said, look, what, what you're going through, this feeling that you don't belong there, that's called imposter syndrome. And everyone has it. It's this feeling that you've been picked for this high-profile thing and someone's made a mistake and you shouldn't really be there. You're wrong. They picked you for a reason and you should know everyone goes through this. And I was a little skeptical. I said, really, everyone goes through this? And she said, uh, okay, there's a few people that don't, but clinically, uh, they're known as assholes. <laughs> so I went out, I calmed down, 
I uh, haven't had nearly as many panic attacks since then. I haven't had any in quite a while un until this week. And, um, <laughs> and then I went on. And a couple years later, I myself was in the orange room at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center giving a seminar that was utterly incomprehensible to the incoming grad students. Thank you. <laughs> So see, we could have told you 27% of all grad students suffer from panic attacks. It would be totally made up, but we could have told you that. It would have been much <laughs> less interesting uh, than what Ben just did here. And the other the thing to notice is look at how much got through there. Um, we got through about imposter syndrome, that it happens to a lot of people, uh, about the fact that uh, panic attacks are often mistaken as heart attacks. Um, there's one more huge one that I'm missing, but oh well. There's you never told <laughs> us what non-perturbative nonsense yeah, there, is. In the longer version of that, I do actually explain what, what quantum corner dynamics is on days when I can pronounce it. For some reason today, I can't. <laughs> um, but we got across all of these things about medicine, about the science, um, and packaged in a way where you remember. You remember about imposter syndrome because of the asshole line, as well as the structure of how we got there. And so this is an incredible way to package information about what you're going through and get people to remember it. And the key here is Ben's telling his own story, which is the natural way that we all communicate when we're having conversations in bars, walking down the street. It's how we're built. So we encourage you, as everyone is doing today, find ways to use stories in what you do. You can use stories about all kinds of different people. I think you should try, if you can, to use your own story, because that's what gets it across to people. Thank you. Thank you.